As we uh, begin the message this morning, I want to just look at a short, uh, take a short quiz here to see if you can recognize these lists of names. This is the first one here. Uh, what is that one that you see? Yes, yeah, the, okay, the Vietnam Memorial, the wall that's there and all the names listed on that wall. Uh, here's the next one. I think I, think I heard somebody say the 9-11 Memorial, okay, there in New York at Ground Zero, all the names of those who lost their lives on that day. Uh, here's the last list. All right, so declaration, you pass your history course for the day. All right, declaration of, of independence there and all the names on that list. Now, we think about these three lists. Um, these are more than just lists of names, right? They carry much more significance than just names carved or etched into stone or written on a sheet of paper. There's a lot of meaning there. There are lessons that we can learn from these lists, from the lives of those on these lists. Well, in our study through Colossians this summer, as we've been working our way through, we come to the last part of Paul's letter today. And in this last part of Paul's letter, it's a list. It's a list of names. Uh, so I'm, what I want us to do is just read through this together, uh, through the whole passage, and then we're going to come back and focus in on some, some key points here. So Paul begins, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. And this is what he writes. He says, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And I had uh, somebody at first service come up to me after, after service. They said, when you read that, I was thinking, you're going to preach on that? <laughs> what are you gonna, how are you going to preach on that? Because it's just a list of names. And that's true. That's what it is. It's a list of names. But this is something God has recorded in His Word. And there is something we can learn from it. Every year at Ground Zero on the anniversary of 9-11, as part of that memorial service, they read aloud the names of all 2,996 people who lost their lives that day. Now, if you were there and one of those people was your relatives, that would be more than just a list of names being read aloud, wouldn't it? That would carry a lot more weight and significance. And at first glance, when we look at this, we say, well, that's just a list of names, weird names, okay, that I'm not used to, people that I I don't know much of anything about. But this is more than just a list. This is the church at its best. I mean, think about this. Aristarchus, he was so committed, he was in prison right along there with Paul. Mark had been on a missionary journey with Paul. He ended up writing one of the Gospels, Justice was one of the uh, Jewish believers of of the few that did not abandon Paul. Luke wrote more verses in the New Testament than Paul did. And this woman named Nympha basically let her house become a church building. She opened up her home so that they could meet there. They were faithful Christians. They were the church. And we as the church today can learn a lot about how we should be the church based on what Paul says about their character, about their actions. 
Paul mentions ten names in this list that he closes his letter with. I want us to focus in on three and what we can learn from them. And, and what we'll see that we can learn from them is going to help strengthen and unify the church. So first, I uh, want us to take a look at that first name he mentions, Tychicus. All right? And he teaches us unity comes through encouragement. Let's look specifically at what he said there again. He said, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. When you look at what Paul says about this man, you, you just get the sense this is a guy you can count on. This is a guy who seems like he would go above and beyond what is expected in his service, in his faithfulness. And Paul specifically mentions him because he knew he had something that that Colossian church needed based on what they were experiencing, what's the, what they were going through, and that he, he was going to encourage their hearts. That Paul knew he was going to do that for them. You know, Tychicus reminds me of our lady circles here at Macedonia. Um, these women's groups do such a good job of sending cards or writing letters anytime we have you know someone within the church maybe an individual or a family member they lose someone or they're going through a sickness or they're just going through a trial and they do such a good job sending cards to encourage people in those moments I can't count the number of times that people have come up to Greg and I and I've said they were just overwhelmed by the number of cards they received to help give them encouragement through a difficult time in their life. Um, and I guarantee you that most of those were probably from the lady circles, most of those cards that they received. Our grief share group okay, here at Macedonia it does, does such a good job with this as well. This is a, a group that if people are struggling with grief in their life, they can be around others who've already walked in their shoes, maybe years kind of ahead of them and what they've experienced, and they can say, hey, I know what you're dealing with. I was there two years ago. Uh, for me personally, just in my ministry, two of the most encouraging people in this church are Warren and Sharon Grubbs. And maybe they're that way for you too. Uh, but always have a comment to share. Uh, Mr. Warren always has some crazy story from all his years in the ministry that will make you laugh. Uh, and then Miss Sharon, her pieces of, you know, her handcrafted pieces of art. If you've ever gotten a card from her, you know what I'm talking about, where she makes these cards, such personal messages that she includes there. And in so many ways have given me exactly what I needed to hear at different times in my life. Sometimes, though, our tongues can be used for discouragement. Comments can be made by Christians that are not intended to build up the body of Christ, but intended to tear down. Maybe it's the Sunday school class member who gossips behind the back of another class member instead of going to that person, as Scripture teaches, individually, face-to-face, -to, -face, to discuss the issue. Or maybe it's the member who can always find a fault in everything, be it a sermon or a worship service or a ministry within the church, but, and, and talk about it, but never takes the time to talk about the things that are good, the things that are going well. I, I read about a couple who went to a restaurant, and a uh, husband and wife, and as soon as they entered in, the husband started to complain. He complained about where they were seated. He complained about the draft on the back of his neck. He complained about the soup being cold. He complained that the steak was too overdone. And so they finished up their meal when they were leaving, and the owner of the restaurant comes out and he speaks to the wife. He says, ma'am, I am so sorry. I know your experience here it didn't seem like it was a good one. I hope you'll give us another chance. And she said, oh, no, my husband could not be happier. He got to complain about everything. <laughs> All right? Maybe we know people like that. They're not happy unless they're complaining. But have you ever noticed what happens to a church when its members do not encourage. It breeds a critical spirit. And the church becomes a depressed place instead of a place of joy as it should be. It definitely becomes a place that no one would ever dream about inviting someone to come. And eventually the church dies. 
Now, when I say be a church of encouragement, I'm not talking about insincere flattery where we encourage people about things that are not true or we avoid hard and difficult conversations that have to be had because a sin needs to be confronted and dealt with. To be a healthy church, we have to have that too. But are we as quick to point out and praise what is good as we are to point out and talk about what we don't like? I believe there's more than one reason, but I believe one of the main reasons, at least in my time being here at Macedonia, that this church is for the most part a joyful place. We're not perfect, but for the most part a joyful place is because we have never sunk into a completely critical spirit about things, which usually leads to a church split. This church has taken care of and encouraged the ministers who have served here. It is a rare thing to have more than one minister who has been at the same church for 30 to 40 years. And we have two. And we have some others that are kind of right, coming up right behind them as well. And that's led to stability for this church. Unity and health come through encouragement. Second, Paul mentions Onesimus and Mark. And they teach us unity comes through forgiveness and reconciliation. Let's look at what Paul said again. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. Onesimus was a slave. He was a slave in the city of Colossae, where Paul's writing this letter. He got tired of being a slave, and so he fled. He ran away, and he ran to the city of Rome. Guess who he met in Rome? He ran into Paul. You know, God providentially aligns that meeting between the two of them, and Paul shares Christ with Onesimus. Onesimus becomes a believer in Jesus, and then Paul gives him a big challenge. He says, Onesimus, I want you to go back to Colossae, and I want you to reconcile with Philemon, who was also a Christian there, but owned him as a slave. Does that mean Paul was condoning slavery? No. But at this time, there were more slaves in Rome than actual citizens of Rome. This was an evil institution that wasn't going to go away overnight. And Paul knew the only way to truly end it was for people's hearts to be changed in Christ. And that begins with forgiveness and reconciliation, especially between these two men. You see, the same God who can use people that mess up terribly before they become Christians is the same God who can use people when they messed up terribly even after they become Christians. Well, Paul goes on and he mentions another example of how unity comes through forgiveness and reconciliation. It's in verse 10. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Do you remember much about Mark? And you think about the book of Acts, it talks a little bit about him. Uh, Mark went with Paul and Barnabas on the very first missionary journey that Paul took to plant churches. Um, it was a difficult journey. If you read through there, Acts chapters 13 and 14, man, they ran into a lot of obstacles, a lot of opposition to what they were trying to do. It was, it was tough. But it ended up being a really successful trip. They planted a lot of churches along the way. And Mark had gone with them. And so they, they finish up. They come back to their home base in the city of Antioch. And Paul, they spend some time there. And Paul says to Barnabas, hey, I've got an idea. Let's take another trip. Let's go back to the same cities. Let's visit those churches we helped to start. Let's see how they're doing. Give them encouragement, instruction if they need it. Barnabas says, hey, that's, that's a great idea Let's bring Mark along again. And Paul says, absolutely not. Do you not remember how he left us on the first trip? I'm not going to risk things on him again. And Barnabas is like, well, let's give him a second chance. And Luke says the disagreement between them about this was so sharp that Paul and Barnabas parted company. Paul chose Silas to go with him on the next trip Barnabas took Mark with him. We really don't hear much more about that whole circumstance in the book of Acts until we come here 
to this letter that Paul wrote, and we see that the friendship has been restored. Paul even says this to Timothy, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. The Apostle Paul had a spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation with Mark. He now welcomes this young man back into the work of the ministry that he's doing where before it seemed like he didn't really want to have much to do with him. Pride has been swallowed, I think, on both people's parts. Previous offenses had been forgiven, and because of it, the church is stronger. The church was more unified. That's not always how it plays out, though, is it? We've all seen churches where people forget whose side they're on, and more importantly, who they belong to. And they begin to fall apart. Not from any external pressure, not from persecution from the outside, but they fall apart from the inside because of unforgiving hearts and pride. I want to take us back to something Paul said earlier in this very letter that we've been looking at. He said, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In the summer of 1986, two ships collided um, in the Black Sea right off the coast of Russia. And around 400 people lost their lives as those ships sank into the icy waters there. But the disaster became even more tragic when they did an investigation to figure out why the ships collided. Come to find out, it wasn't a malfunction in the radar, it wasn't a thick fog, it wasn't rough seas that caused it. The cause was basically human stubbornness. Each captain was aware of the exact location of the other ship, had plenty of time to correct course so that they did not collide with one another. But in the investigation, what they basically found out, each captain felt they had the right of way and they were not going to yield. If we ever wrong someone in this church, we should go to that person and we should apologize and we should ask for forgiveness. If we have been wronged, we should give up whatever right we think we have to hold a grudge and we should forgive as the Lord forgave us. Because I guarantee you this, we will never be asked to forgive something that is greater than what God has forgiven us through His Son, Jesus Christ. This is hard to do. But in the end, if we will just simply obey the command to do it, the church will be stronger for it. And it will be a witness of the power of Christ to change people's lives. Finally, we've got Epaphras. He teaches us that unity comes through a powerful prayer life. Epaphras, like Onesimus, was also from this city that Paul was writing this letter to. He was the one who started the church there. And he had left and gone to Rome to visit Paul while he was in prison. And Paul described something about Epaphras that I think is so crucial for every member of a church and something important for all of us to do. Now, let's look at what he said. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. That phrase Paul uses there, he's wrestling in prayer for you. That original Greek word that Paul uses there is the word where we get our English word, agonize. These are not flippant prayers. Uh, these prayers that Epaphras prayed, they were intense prayers. They were passionate prayers for the people in the church. Greg and I know this because we've been told uh, by certain individuals that every time we preach a sermon or we lead worship on a Sunday, there are individuals within this church who long before that Sunday have been praying for that morning. They've been praying for the message that was to be preached. They were praying about the songs that would be sung and the scriptures that would be read, that people would be receptive to the Holy Spirit and how the Word of God was trying to work to change all of us, that 
that they would be that that would be successful. They're praying for Greg Webb. They're praying for Joe and our youth. They're praying for the deacons in this church and the different ministries that they help to head up and the needs that they work hard to meet within our church family and within the community as well. That they're praying hard for our elders, that they lead with wisdom, that they lead with boldness, that they lead with faithfulness to the Word of God, no matter what our culture may be trying to pressure us into to abandon God's truth in any way, that they would not, that they would lead with faithfulness. I know there are people who pray hard for that. Problem is, it's easy to think about prayer as a behind-the-scenes, ordinary, maybe even secondary thing to be done in addition to all the things that have to be done within the life of a church. But when we do that, we underestimate the power of prayer and the power of the lives of people who are prayer warriors about those kinds of things. I read about a professor at Texas A&M University, and he um, shared a, a story about a personal story in his own life, uh, sent it into the Reader's Digest. And uh, he wrote that he would teach classes all day long. And then in the evening, he would go to the library there on campus, and he would begin his research for the next day or for some project he was working on or, or an extra degree he was trying to earn. But he said at, at every evening at 9 o'clock, he would stop his research, he would get online, and he would play a popular game at that time called World of Warcraft. And th this is an online game where other people can join on and you can play together. And the game is about battle strategy. It's just about, you know, developing the best strategy to win in these different situations. And so uh, you, t you usually team up with somebody to play the game. And on this particular night, the professor teamed up with somebody that he had never played with before. But he could immediately tell this individual was just a master strategist. I mean, nobody could stop him. He was two to three steps ahead of everybody else who was playing. And he said uh, they had won about six games straight. And then this, this guy who was playing with him that he didn't know uh, typed in on the little instant message thing that's part of the game, and this is what he typed. He said, well, I've got to go now. My mom says I have to go to bed. And so the professor typed back, and he asked, well, how old are you? And this boy typed back. He said, I'm 12. How old are you? And the professor, not even blinking, typed back, I'm 8. <laughs> you know, there's no way this professor could have imagined that this guy he was playing with, who was this master strategist, was a 12-year-old boy. My guess is all of us have made the mistake at some point in our lives of overlooking someone. Maybe they were younger, maybe they were introverted, maybe they were less influential. Aren't we thankful that God doesn't do that? He sees those who have a powerful prayer life that is usually behind the scenes. It's something we never see, maybe even never hear about, never notice, but we feel it, don't we? We feel the difference that it makes. And God sees it as key to the kingdom of God and key to the strength and health of the church. So, what does a church look like that puts Christ above all? That's the theme we've been talking about here in Colossians. It looks something like this. It's a list of names. Something as simple as that. Let's pray together. Father, it is amazing how much you can teach us from just a list of names. We must encourage one another. We must sacrifice for one another. We must be humble enough to forgive and reconcile with one another. And we must be prayer warriors for one another. Help us to be the kind of church we have read about today. In Jesus' name, amen.